All right. Well, on behalf of the Commission on Credentialing and Placement for the Eastern Regional Conference of the Churches of God, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our uh, virtual lecture. Uh, our lecture today is What is Jesus Doing Now? Uh, and we will be hearing from Dr. Patrick Schreiner. Uh, Dr. Schreiner is Associate Professor of New Testament and Biblical Theology at the Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, and Dr. Schreiner, we are delighted to have you with us today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, some of Dr. Schreiner's publications include uh, The Kingdom of God and the Glory of the Cross. Uh, he also wrote The Ascension of Christ, Recovering a Neglected Doctrine. Uh, and he also has a new commentary on the Book of Acts in the Christian Standard uh, Commentary Series, uh, which was supposed to be released this week. Uh, that's been delayed a little bit, but hopefully in the next uh, couple of days or, or weeks, uh, that will be out and we look forward uh, to that. Uh, now, a quick note about how we'll do things today. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen, you have a, a, a chat button, uh, and I encourage you to make use of that throughout Dr. Schreiner's lecture. If there's anything that you want to uh, communicate to the other participants today, we encourage you uh, to use that chat button. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like to direct uh, directly to Dr. Schreiner, uh, I would ask that you use the Q&A button uh, and at the end of our time together, as time allows, uh, we'll try to, to answer those, get to as many of those questions uh, as we can. Uh, the other thing I'll mention, and I'll, I'll try to mention this at the end of our time as well, uh, but our next event will be coming up on October 24th, uh, and that's going to be a live event in which we're going to have a, uh, a series of lectures from Dr. Lynn Kohick. Uh, and so I do hope that you'll put October 24th uh, on your calendars and, and plan on joining us then. Well, let me pray for us and, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Father God, we thank you so much uh, for this time that we have together. We thank you that uh, even as we are spread apart geographically, we can uh, gather through the internet and uh, think through, Lord, what it means to be your people. Uh, to follow you, to worship you. Uh, Jesus, we thank you that you are our risen Savior, uh, that you are uh, continually and actively involved in our lives. And, and as we think deeply today about what that means and what that looks like for us, I pray that you would uh, anoint Dr. Schreiner, that you would speak through him, that you would Give us ears to hear that we might uh, be drawn ever closer to you this day. Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Uh, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dr. Schreiner, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Judd, for having me. And thanks, everyone, for joining. I hope this will be, and I pray this will be a beneficial time for us all. Uh, I love thinking and talking about this topic. Uh, obviously, I wrote a short book on it, but even just to begin us, um, really, when I started writing a commentary on Acts, that was when, if you begin reading right away, you, you come, even as you see on the text, hopefully in front of you, that you come immediately as you're studying Acts to the Ascension. And I'd been convinced, even before writing my commentary on Acts, that the Ascension was one of those events that we don't speak a lot about, but really is central to the imagination, to the thoughts, to the doctrines of the New Testament authors and the subsequent church. And um, my contention is that it's been neglected somewhat in our day, and I'm going to go through some arguments for that as we go through this session. So let me give you just to begin kind of a brief overview of what I hope to do, I have a tendency in class to um, promise way too much and then only get uh, a little ways, but uh, I will tell you what I what I hope to do in this lecture. And um, I hope to provide time for question and answer at the end because I always find that beneficial and um, not everyone loves to hear me drone on the whole time. So um, what I hope to do here is just really give an introduction to the Ascension and talk about why we've neglected it and why we should put it back into a more central place in our thinking, even in our practices. 
And then I want to transition to more of what Christ is doing now. And that'll be probably shorter and more at the end, because I do want to set up why we should be thinking about this. Um, and I'll, I'll spend the bulk of the time on that. And so, um, yeah, let's just jump right in. Uh, so a lot of this will be more introductory, but we will go to some texts. And so hopefully you can see the screen uh, or you can have a Bible with you because I think it's important to look at these texts as we go through them. So um, let me just in introduce this by talking about what, what is the Ascension? What are we talking about? Uh, the Ascension refers to when Jesus Christ went up to heaven and was seated at the right hand of God. And this is narrated, we're going to talk about this more, at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts. You can see on your screen, Acts 1, 9 through 11. Um, you know, there, there's two different ways, actually, of describing the Ascension, and I'm using the ascension more holistically. The ascension is actually refers to the journey of Jesus going up into heaven. So that's what the ascension refers to. In theological circles, uh, the session is his sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's the goal of the journey to sit on the throne at the right hand of the Father. But when I say ascension, I'm not just referring to the journey. Uh, I think in the theological tr tradition, this is how a lot of people think of it too. just refer to the ascension. The ascension refers to the uh, session as well, his sitting. And so we can distinguish the two, but I'm, I'm bringing those two together. So that's, that's what we're referring to. Um, however, a big part of my argument here is that this event is often neglected or not thought about enough in our own theological thinking, in our own church practices. Uh, Douglas Farrow, there's not a ton of books on the Ascension. One of the authors who wrote a book on the Ascension said this about the Ascension. He said, it, it is remarkable how little mention the Ascension gets these days. Once it was seen as the climax of the mystery of Christ, today it is something of an embarrassment. And we will talk about why it's an embarrassment. So let me just give you two evidences, and I'm going to give you a lot more as we go, but I'm setting this up a little bit, two evidences of how I think it is it is true that we've neglected the ascension, our own kind of theological thinking. Um, number one is when I hear a gospel presentation, um, typically I hear summaries of Jesus's life, his death, and sometimes his resurrection, hopefully his resurrection, Rarely do I hear anything when we talk about the gospel, what happened in salvation. Rarely do I hear anything about the ascension. And I think that is a key clue that it just doesn't loom large for us in our theological system. So what is the good news? Would you, maybe I'll pose it as a question, would you include the ascension as part of that good news story? Is it central to it? Is it necessary for it? Um, is it a central part of the gospel story? Uh, another way to put that as a question is, would it have changed the story at all if Jesus had not ascended? So my argument is going to be, yes, obviously it would, and that we need to actually include this in our gospel presentations. And uh, we have a tendency, I use this illustration at times, we have a tendency to actually pause the narrative. Um, I, I listen to audiobooks. And um, the, the funny thing about audiobooks is when you're listening to it, I typically listen to them while I'm doing a task, such as getting ready for the day, such as driving to work, something like that. And typically those tasks end at an inopportune time. In other words, if you're sitting and read a physical book, you can kind of end at the end of a chapter. But, you know, when I get home from work, um, it, it's over in the middle of a chapter. So one of one of the books that I was reading at one point, it came to the climax of the book and I literally pulled into my house and I had to shut it off as the author uh, or the protagonist said, and then everyone died or something to that effect. And I was like, you know, the kids were coming out to say hi to me. And it just, um, that illustration revealed to me, there's a sense in which we also, as we tell the gospel story, can actually pause that narrative before uh, it's over. And I'm I'm going to argue the, the gospel story isn't over at the resurrection. We need to include the ascension in how we speak about what Christ did. The second evidence of us neglecting it, uh, and I'm going to give more than this, but just to kind of introduce us to this, 
is that um, in what I call the low church tradition, so you have high church traditions that um, do follow more of a church calendar uh, and a liturgy, whether it's Anglican, Catholic, Greek Orthodox, um, they include the Ascension as kind of one of, they have an Ascension Day that they celebrate. But um, in the low church tradition, we, we typically celebrate uh, Christmas, the Incarnation, uh, Good Friday, Jesus' death, and then Easter, his resurrection. But we kind of think of resurrection as the climax. And after that, we, there's nothing else to celebrate. Um, but again, in the high church tradition, there's been, a, there's actually been the pattern in, in the history of the church to have the incarnation, death, resurrection, ascension after that, 40 days later, um, and then also have Pentecost after that. And so to say like the story, I, I think that's actually a helpful way of thinking of it. The story is not over after the resurrection. We need to include the ascension is in this as well. And so you can think about your own church tradition, depending on what you do. I'm not saying you have to celebrate an ascension Sunday, but I am saying maybe even the way that we've gone about celebrating incarnation, death, and resurrection, that is almost teaching us and our people that those are the three things we need to think about and the ascensions kind of what do we do with this? So um, that, that sets us up to evidences of why I think we have neglected it or just more clearly at a, at a, um, at, at, at like a, um, how do I put this, at, at a level that we can just understand have, have we made it central in our own understanding. So throughout this lecture, I'm going to be arguing it is central, it is important, it's central to the gospel, it's a climax of Christ's work. It answers, and this is the, the title of this lecture, what is Jesus doing now? Um, Peter Orr, who's a scholar in Australia, said this, Christians have tended to focus their attention on what Jesus has done, his life, death, and resurrection, and what he will do, return and reign. Studies on what Christ is doing now or what happened after the resurrection are relatively rare. So another, another way to pose the question of why the ascension is so important is just, what do you think Jesus is doing now? We talk a lot about, as Peter Orr says, what he did and what he will do. But is Jesus just kind of sitting in heaven waiting for this thing to get over? Or is he actually acting now? And I'm going to argue he's continuing to act now, and he's actually, actually acting in a better way now. So if I were to give you a little a pre, a preview of, of my argument, which I will give in brief, but a preview of it is that the ascension is a key plot moment, a hinge on which, on which Christ's work turns. It not only authorizes and endorses Jesus's work, but it actually continues Jesus's what I call threefold role of prophet, priest, and king. It, it culminates those. His earthly work is over in one sense, uh, but it marks a shift in Christ's function as prophet, priest, and king. He now works from the heavens. So as the prophet, he builds his church. As the priest, he intercedes in heaven. As the king, he reigns over all. And there's a unique sense in which he was certainly doing that on the earth, but he's doing it in a better sense now after the ascension. Um, and so it's not that we wish Jesus was back. We do wish Jesus is back on the earth to bring in the new heavens and new earth, but that there is actually a, a sense in which we tend to think, oh, Jesus left. And that might be a bad thing. According to the scriptures, Jesus left. And that's actually a good thing. It's good that he went away. So I would also add that not only that, not only does he continue to work, but he, and, and tied into this is that he empowers his church after the ascension to be prophet, priests, and kings, his royal family on the earth by the Spirit. And so it's not only that he continues to work, but he empowers us to continue to work. So um, that, that's kind of intro here. I'm just trying to see where my time is at. We could talk about, um, I'm probably going to skip this, in the Jewish world, um, Enoch, Jacob, Elijah, son of man, we'll, we'll maybe speak to a few of those as we go on, but uh, ascension stories were not unknown of. Uh, or are not unknown in the Old Testament. Uh, and then in the Greco-Roman world, there's also apotheosis, where you would have Greco-Roman rulers who would also ascend. Uh, emperors would seem, they would see them as ascend to the heavens, supposedly, and they would be um, given kind of the label as a god or a son of god in that. So it's not completely unheard of, 
when you come to the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, uh, ascension stories are kind of in that tradition, both in the Jewish tradition and the Greco-Roman tradition. But that's getting a little deeper in terms of uh, the background to it. And we can talk about that more in the questions if you want to. So um, I already gave two reasons why we seem or evidences for why we neglect it. Let me give you now five more specific reasons for why we, we might not think a lot about the ascension. And this is, is going more to the scriptures and logic and things like that. So um, first, we might neglect the ascension because it does seem like the Bible speaks very little of it. Um, you know, when I, I intro this, you have Acts 1, 9 through 11 here. Uh, where it speaks about Jesus's ascension. That's three verses. You also have uh, Luke, and I'll just turn there, Luke 24, verses 50 through 53. He led them out to the vicinity of Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he left them and was carried up into heaven. And after worshiping, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So it, it does seem like the Bible doesn't speak a lot about the ascension because it's only at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts that it's actually narrated. Um, at the end of the other Gospels, you might argue, well, if, if this is so important, why at the end of Matthew is Jesus still there? At the end of Matthew, Jesus is on the mountain with his disciples. He gives them his great commission. And really, Matthew doesn't narrate the ascension. And so one in one sense, you could argue with me that, um, you know, you say it's really important, but Matthew didn't think it's very important. He doesn't even ha he doesn't even have it in his gospel. He just ends with Jesus on the mountain. Uh, also, if you look at the end of Mark, Mark sixteen verse eight, you know we can talk about. I don't think uh, verses nine and following are original. So if it ends right here in Mark sixteen eight, they went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them, and they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. Mark also doesn't narrate the ascension. So that is uh, two, two gospels now that we don't have that narrate the ascension in Mark 16, 8, even though my computer went down there. Uh, you also have John 21. At the end of John, uh, Jesus is again with his disciples on the beach eating fish. He's still with them. And so maybe it's just really important to Luke because at the end of Luke, in the beginning of Acts, it is narrated, but the end of the other Gospels, we don't have the story of the Ascension, which I think is part of the reason why we probably don't think about it a lot. Because even if you're preaching through books of the Bible, if you're preaching expositional sermons, you're not going to encounter it that much in terms of the narrative. So I keep qualifying that. I will argue with myself in just a minute. But um, I do want to set that up. The other thing to mention is in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 through 2, uh, and actually following, um, Paul makes known to them the gospel. I, I'm going to argue it's central to the gospel. Uh, but how does Paul summarize the gospel? He says, I passed on to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died, death, that he was buried. And that he was raised to the day, uh, raised uh, on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared, and he appeared to a lot. Then he appeared to more people. Uh, last of all, he appeared to me. N notice what he doesn't speak about here. He doesn't speak about the ascension specifically. So again, you could argue with me. Hey, look, uh, Paul's nice little summary of Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. Paul thinks that's a nice little summary of the gospel. So maybe the ascension isn't as important as you're saying. I'm going to argue that's not the case, but I'm just going to leave it there. It seems like the Bible doesn't speak a lot about the ascension. Second reason we might neglect it is because, to be honest, the implications are unclear to us. Why did Jesus need to ascend? Wasn't the resurrection enough? What if he didn't ascend? Would that really matter? Could he have set up his kingdom on the earth at that point. You know, the resurrection makes a lot of sense to me, but the ascension, in one sense, it's a little more confusing. Jesus rose from the dead. He's alive. That's really good news. Jesus left the earth and went up to sit at the right hand of the Father. I think that's good news, but it's a little harder to say, well, we, we, we would actually like him to be with us and not reigning in the heavens, in the new heavens and new earth, he'll be reigning here on the earth. So um, I think the disciples fall into this type of thinking. So it's not abnormal for you or your people to think this way. 
Because the disciples, after Jesus has rose from the dead, when they come together, they ask, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel at this time? In other words, now that you've been raised from the dead, can we kind of finish this kingdom project? And Jesus gives a complicated answer, but he's, he says, no, this story has another part to it. And then we get a narration of the ascension. So the disciples somewhat think the same thing. I, I, they, they were maybe a little bit confused. Um, you can see even here, uh, the two men in white clothes say, why do you stand looking up into heaven? Maybe they were a little confused about what's happening right now. Why? Why is Jesus leaving? Why doesn't he stay and establish the kingdom? So I think they do figure out why it's important. We'll see that in the sermons. But at that moment, they are they seem to be a little confused. So I would just say the implications, again, to um, summarize this point, the implications for why he needed to ascend, the narratives that give us the ascension don't explain why he needed to ascend. You need your whole Bible for that, really. And so we, we tend to have kind of a microscope picture of the scriptures that we take. I'm going to meditate on the ascension. So I'm just going to go to the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts. But there's really no explanation for why he ascended in these texts. And so really, uh, my, my former pastor used to say, it takes a whole Bible to, take a, to make a whole Christian. <laughs> it takes a whole Bible to understand really what's going on in the ascension. And I think there, uh, the, the, the authors of the scriptures are assuming that you will be able or you will be taught to fill in the gaps for why this event was necessary. Okay, so two reasons why we neglect it. I'm going to give five, but the Bible speaks a little of it. Uh, The implications are unclear. Third, it seems like a bad plan. So this is tied in um, to, to the previous point, but you know, let's just go through some premises and conclusions. Premise one, being with Jesus bodily in the new heavens and new uh, new earth is the best end state. That's what we're longing for. We're longing for him to return. Premise two, Jesus is no longer with us in his body. Conclusion, it would have been better if he didn't leave. And so it, it just seems like, why didn't he stay and establish the kingdom at that point? Like the disciples asked. So it, if we if we just ask someone, maybe even who's a new believer, um, like, would it have been better if Jesus had stayed? I think a lot of us would say, man, I, I, I just wish he could stay on the earth and I could walk with him and talk with him and so forth and so on, and that he'd be with us. And that's a good desire because that's what we're longing for in terms of his return. But the scriptures explicitly say it's better that he left. So we have to reconcile that. But at, at, at kind of an initial reaction, it seems like a bad plan. Uh, fourth, reason we neglect it is the event is just honestly abnormal. Um, I remember the first time I think I preached on the Ascension, I was walking around um, a park and I was kind of meditating on the sermon. And it was actually one of those days that was perfect for an Ascension sermon because there was these big clouds in the air and the sunlight was kind of coming through them like we imagine what the Ascension was like, right? Um, And I remember just looking up into the sky and thinking how glorious and beautiful it must have been, but also how strange it must have been to watch uh, a middle-aged Jewish man kind of float up into the sky and then a cloud cover him. And I even thought of some strange questions like, um, you know, how fast did he ascend? It doesn't tell us. Was it a pretty quick thing? Was it a really slow thing? Like where you can see him for a long time? Uh, what, What did that even look like? And I bring this up because it is kind of a, a it, it is objectively a strange event because we don't see people floating up into the sky every day, nor I don't, I don't think have you ever seen that happen. Um, and, you know, in our modern kind of scientific perspective, where did Jesus go and how did he make it through um, the atmosphere without a spacesuit? Like, what is, he, if he had a true human body, what did it look like for him to not have, like, what, what, where did, what happened there? So I think post Galileo, post Newton, post Copernicus, the ascent just seems ridiculous. 
And we are, I'm a Bible believing person, but I think from a kind of modern scientific perspective, maybe one of the reasons we've neglected it is because um, we, we don't know how to explain these things. This is difficult. So it's an abnormal event. Final reason that we might neglect the ascension is because um, it is true, and you maybe you're thinking this, but it is true that the scriptures at times tend to subsume the ascension under the resurrection. I would argue that's what's happening in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, notice here in Romans 1, kind of 3 through 4, concerning, he's talking about um, the gospel of God, which God promised beforehand, concerning his son, who was according to the flesh, you know, the descendant of David, and was appointed to be the powerful son of God. So he's not only uh, a, a man, but he's more than a man. He was appointed to be the powerful son of God, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Notice there's no mention of ascension again there, just by the resurrection. Um, you could also think about a text like, I think it's Luke 24, 26. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Is that, I think that's more of a direct reference actually to the ascension, but um, it could be kind of resurrection and ascension together. Um, maybe another one is Philippians 2, 8 and 9. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. For this reason, God has highly exalted him. Resurrection or ascension or both. And gave him the name that is above every name, so the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So my point is here, um, there's a tendency in the scriptures, and I'm not critiquing the scriptures for this, but to speak of Jesus' exaltation, and to speak of his exaltation as resurrection and ascension. That's not a bad thing, but there's the tendency maybe then on our part to assume it only is referring to the resurrection and not the ascension as well. But I think the scriptures are bringing both of those together. I think we need to distinguish between them, and we need to recognize that they're related. But they're, they are unique events. They're different events. And so in our own thinking processes, I think sometimes we will get to the exaltation of Jesus, but we will only say the resurrection and not the ascension. Okay, so those are the five reasons why I think we neglect it. Let me give you now kind of to argue with myself uh, it looks like we're about 30 minutes in, and so I think this is okay. But um, let me give you five reasons why not to neglect the ascension. So um, my first point, if you remember, was that the Bible speaks little of it. But I think that's not respecting actually how the Bible speaks of the ascension. It's not true that Matthew doesn't care about the ascension because he doesn't narrate it, nor Mark, nor John. Just because they don't tell the story doesn't mean it's a part of how they thought about what happened to Jesus. So where's some evidence for that? Let's go to a few texts. Matthew 26, 64. This is when Jesus is on trial uh, and he's speaking to uh, the high priest. And the high priest says, tell us, are you the Messiah, the son of God? And Jesus says, you have said so, but I tell you in the future you will see the son of man seated on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now you could argue that refers to his second coming. I think Acts tells us we need to relate the ascension and the second coming. But my major point is Jesus himself and Matthew in his own gospel is referring to the ascension and the second coming in these words. So it's not that he doesn't think it's important. It's just, he doesn't narrate it in the same way. Uh, even more convincing, I think, in Matthew is Matthew 28, verse 18, when he says, all authority has been given to me on heaven, in heaven and on earth. And that, we're going to come back to this text, but that's a pretty clear allusion to um, Daniel 7, 14. The son of man is given dominion, glory, a kingdom, so that every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. So notice dominion, glory, kingdom. And then what's the result of that? Nations should serve him. So come back to the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me. Every kingdom has been given to me. 
where do you go? Go into the nations and make disciples of these nations. So all that to say, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, even though Jesus is still on the mountain with his disciples, he is clearly alluding to Daniel 7, 13 through 14, which is an ascension text. And so I think Matthew is trying to emphasize Jesus's uh, continued presence with us. And so he leaves him on the mountain. But even in these words, he's pointing forward to the ascension. So it's not that Matthew doesn't care about it. He just doesn't narrate it. Um, same thing is true for Mark. Mark 14, 62. Um, you know, you have the same kind of line from Jesus on the trial about the Son of Man from Daniel 7. Um, you also have in the longer ending of Mark a reference to the ascension. And so it's pretty clearly important in the in the Christian tradition, in the early Christian tradition. And then I'd also say um, in John, you know, we mentioned oh, at the at the end of John, Jesus is still there. Well, um, six times. And if you actually read through John and you remember how Jesus speaks, Jesus references again and again how he is going to go to the Father, how he's going to depart and be with the Father. And ha- he, he, he just, it, it's like a major theme of Jesus's speech. And so while it's not maybe narrated, um, look at a few texts with me. John 14, 12, truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Uh, Yeah, we might want to talk about that some, and I think we're going to return to that. What does that mean? You're going to do greater works, and it's tied to the ascension, the greater works. Uh, John 14, 28, you heard me tell you, I am going away, and I'm coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I'm going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. No, notice, I am going away. I am going to the Father. That is in reference to the ascension. Uh, John 16, verse 10. And about righteousness, uh, because I'm going to the Father, you will no longer see me. Uh, John 16, verse 17. Then some of his disciples said to him, what is he telling us? In a little while, you will not see me again. In a little while, you will see me because I am going to the Father. They didn't know what he was talking about at that time. Um, he, jo- Jesus also makes just more, ex- I think, ex- what I call explicit reference. Um, then what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? John 6, and he's the bread of life. Um, so, you know, he talks about departing before the father. I could go to just a ton of references here, um, knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the father, having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them to the end. So it's, it's not completely true to say, Hey, the Bible doesn't speak a lot about it. It's just in different places. And it's only narrated twice. The other thing to mention in terms of where it's spoken about in the scriptures, is that um, Jesus's title of Lord is based, I would argue, upon, yes, the resurrection, but and upon the ascension. And so one of the surest markers that they are thinking in terms of the ascension is Jesus's just title Lord. So when you go to the beginning of the epistles, and I'll show you this from a text from Acts, he was appointed to be the powerful son of God, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Um, that, that's not exactly the text I was looking for. First Corinthians, actually one, maybe one through two. Um, Christ Jesus, to Jesus Christ, our Lord. Just again and again, he calls him the Lord. Now, how did he become the Lord? Well, Acts, is it 2.23? No, it's Acts 2. Uh, 36, sorry. Uh, after Paul, uh, after um, Peter has given his Pentecost sermon, he quotes from Psalm 110 1 here, and he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, in light, as you're going to see in the sermon in light of his ascension. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but then he quotes Psalm 110.1. 1. 
Okay, so Jesus's just title of Lord, if you see lordship anywhere in the New Testament, that's based on Jesus's, yes, his resurrection, but maybe even more so in some sense, his resurrection. I'd also argue that the language of uh, headship, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, he exercised this power in Christ by raising him from the dead. Okay, resurrection and seating him at his right hand in the heavens, far above um, all rule and authority. And he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for his church. So there's something about the ascension that makes him head over everything and Lord over everything. And we saw that already in Matthew 28, verse 18. Um, Okay, so first reason why we should not neglect the ascension, long reason, and the other ones will be shorter what is because it's i would argue it's all over the bible it's all over just the the foundation of really jesus being the messiah and lord is based on this kind of climactic exaltation of jesus in the ascension um uh second point maybe i'll go more quickly over this because i kind of alluded to it the ascension in the first christian sermons if you look at acts 2 acts 3 and acts 5 just the first christian sermons it's very clear that Jesus' ascension is actually part and parcel of their gospel presentation. I would argue, even if you look at Acts 2, he Peter, or sorry, yeah, Peter spends more time on Jesus' resurrection and ascension than on his life and death. Now, it's just a summary, and obviously we need to think through all of the gospel of Luke that gives us the whole narrative of Jesus' life and death. But post-resurrection and ascension, Peter ends up emphasizing Jesus's victory. And so in our own gospel preaching, I think we need to imitate these sermons and acts in terms of emphasizing we have a Christian gospel because Jesus has been raised from the dead and he has ascended to the heavens. Okay. So we could go to some of those texts. If you want to look Acts 2, 33, Acts 3, 21, Acts 5, 31 through 32, but I'm going to move over that point. Um, third reason why we should not neglect the ascension is because it's a canonical hinge. The ascension marks the birth of a new age, the new covenant, and the end of the old era. On the dime of the ascension, the Bible transitions from the age of Jesus to the age of the church. So we've already looked at some of these texts, but there is a real sense in which the ascension marks the shift in terms, it's the foundation for our new mission. So if you go to Acts 1, 9 through 11, remember, Here's the ascension, and it's tied very closely to what? You need to go out, you will receive the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So one of the ways I say it is if you care about mission and the mission of the church, the mission of the church is just based on the reality of the ascension of Jesus, because Jesus is Lord of all. Therefore, the logic is, according to the scriptures, we can go into all nations and tell everyone about about Jesus. Now, Jesus's mission in his life was relegated largely, not completely, but largely to Israel. This is what Jesus says to the Canaanite woman. This is what Jesus says to his disciples to go nowhere among the Samaritans, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's only after Jesus's resurrection and his ascension that he says, now go into all nations. And you're like, well, again, go back to Matthew 28. What about that? He's not gone yet. He tells him to go. But again, I think he's pointing forward to his ascension there in light of me being exalted to the heavens in light of me reigning and ruling over all of heaven and earth. Therefore, right there it is. Go and make disciples of all nations because I am Lord of all. You have a mission to all. And so this is uh, so important in terms of our own kind of conception of what, what are we, what age are we living in now? Well, we're living in Under the rule of Christ, yes, but he's reigning in the heavens. That rule is manifested in the church, and we are called to go out and spread the rule of Jesus to all nations. Uh, uh, Another thing to say about the canonical hinge, why it's so important, and we're going to talk about this more if we have time, 1043, um, is it's at the ascension, I would argue, that the Father and maybe the Son, big whole debate in church history on this, that the Father and the Son send the Spirit. And it's not until Jesus has ascended 
that they send the spirit. So we now live, yes, in the age of the spirit in one sense. That doesn't mean Jesus is not working or that he's completely absent. It's the spirit of Jesus who is with us. But they tie these two events together. Um, notice in Acts 2.33, therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. This is Acts 2, straight after Pentecost. The logic that Peter gives here is because of the exaltation of Jesus, you now have the Spirit. There's something about how these two events come together. Um, and I have more thoughts on that, but I don't have time to get into that. If we have time, I will. Um, go, Acts 5.31, God exalted this man to the right hand as ruler and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins is tied to the presence of the spirit. And so you can see again in Acts 5.31 that these two things are linked. We might come back to this text, but one more text. John 15.26. When the counselor comes, the one whom I will send from the Father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. The one I will send to you from the Father. I think that's after his ascension. So there's... Again, we, we need to, we can talk about this more in terms of the relationship becoming the, between the coming of the Spirit and the ascension of Jesus. One way to talk about it is, um, and we can talk about uh, processions and mission uh, uh, in terms of the, the life of the triune God. But another way to speak of it, maybe in a way that is more understandable to people in the church, is that there's a sense in which when Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father, he pierces that barrier between heaven and earth. And now the Spirit comes and brings heaven to earth in some sense, as he dwells with us uh, at Pentecost and post-Pentecost. Um, I have more there. I have other notes here, but I'm going to skip those. So ascension is not only spoken about a lot in the New Testament and in the whole Bible. It's not only in the first Christian sermons, but it functions as a canonical hinge. Fourth, and then I'll get to fifth more quickly, um, it's, it's in the creeds. So if uh, you are a confessional Christian and you believe in the creeds, uh, the Apostles' Creed has a separate line that says Jesus ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And that is distinct and separate from their statement about Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. The Nicene Creed says the Son was made incarnate. He suffered. He rose from the dead. So notice he became a man. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And the Nicene Creed goes on to say, and he ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. So Whatever you think about the creeds, very early on, Christians were thinking about what's the core, what's the core of our faith? What's central to our confessions? Well, they included the ascension as a separate line. Uh, the First Council of Constantinople, the Ascension Creed, all of the historic confessions have the ascension of Jesus. So uh, it's not only important in the Bible, but it's important as the early Christians began to uh, identify what do we need to confess as Christians? Uh, finally, fifth reason we should not neglect the ascension is because I think it's important in our liturgy. And what do I mean by that? I don't mean liturgy in terms of we all have to do the same thing in church or the liturgy is, um, it has to be, it has to look this way. But what I mean is that everything that you're doing in church is actually acknowledging the ascension, whether you know it or not. So uh, in prayer, we look heavenward to Jesus in prayer, and we pray to him because he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Um, we arise in our baptism, recognizing that's both a picture of our new life, and we long to be with him again. We, we In the Lord's Supper, we take of Christ, who resides in heaven, though the symbols of bread, through the symbols of bread and wine. Uh, and in another sense, we lift up our hearts to him as he resides in the heavens, uh, and he descends to us in the elements themselves. Uh, another way to put this is we preach from his word, but the true word of God is in heaven, the one word of God. And that doesn't mean our word is insufficient, but we're waiting for the word to return. And so uh, when I say the ascension in liturgy, I'm saying everything that we do is actually, it, it acknowledges it, it. It's based on our confession that Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father. So conclusion to this section, uh, and it's 1048, I do have some time to get to some other things. Um, let me just say this in conclusion to five reasons we neglect it and five reasons we shouldn't. Christians have never believed that the cross nor the resurrection was the end of Jesus's work. But sometimes, sometimes 
what is assumed is overlooked. The ascension of Christ is critical for any reading of the whole Bible. It's a vital hinge upon which Christ's work turns, and I'm going to get to that. And though it can be neglected, Christ's ascent was central to the New Testament, the early creeds, the first Christian sermons, and the transition from the Jesus age to the age of the church. So my big argument here is we can't neglect the ascension. It is very important to the story. Now, in times where I give a six-hour lecture on this, now I go on and I give a ton of texts explaining exactly why it's essential. And I'm going to give you a little preview of that. I don't have time to do all of that. And so what I want to do is look at Jesus's kind of offices uh, briefly of prophet, priest, and king, and show you that the ascension, as I argued, not only authorizes, but amplifies and multiplies Jesus's work as prophet, priest, and king. In other words, put it in layman's terms, Jesus is a better prophet, a better priest, and a better king now that he has ascended. Not that it was, um, when I say better, that might sound like, you know, in his life, it was, um, it, it was incomplete, but it's not that it was flawed in his life, but that rather he, he's entered a new era of him being prophet, a new era of him being priest, a new era of him being king. Okay. Um, so what happened to Jesus's prophetic work in the ascension. So this, this is getting more to the question of what is Jesus doing now? What is Jesus doing now? Why does it matter that Jesus ascended? Um, I, I think, and I'll just give you very brief on this. I think we would all agree that Jesus was a prophet upon the earth. Those who saw him walk around and preach and heal, they identified him as a prophet. He's certainly more than a prophet, but he came in the mold of the prophet. Many New Testament scholars will even say, you know, what did they think of Jesus when they first saw him? Uh, first century people, Jewish people. They would have thought, here's a prophet. And that's exactly what they say. Isn't this the prophet from Nazareth? Um, when, when in Matthew 16, uh, who do the people say that I am? Some say Elijah. Some say one of the prophets. Some say Jeremiah. It's all, it's all prophetic linked. Peter saying, people think you're a prophet. Um, so Jesus was a prophet on the earth. But my argument is at the ascension, he's now a better prophet because he's now building his church by the Spirit. Now, um, to understand this with each of these sections, if I have time, I want to go back to one Old Testament story just briefly to show you, to understand the ascension, you need to think about the Old Testament story and how it kind of uh, previewed and set us up for the ascension. So remember how I mentioned at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, they don't give us a lot of like theological, like this is why the ascension is so important. What they want you to do, I think, is fill in previous stories, what I call shadow stories of ascensions that help you understand what's going on in Jesus's own, uh, that, that, that event. Um, so one of the key texts in terms of how does Jesus become a better, better prophet uh, after the ascension is um, 2 Kings chapter 2, where Elijah goes up before Elisha in the whirlwind. This is an ascension story. And it's not only an ascension story, but there's a transition from Elijah to Elisha. And that will match the transition from Jesus to Jesus empowering his church in the New Testament. Okay? So I think this story, what I'm trying to get at, is this story is setting us up for how to understand what is happening in Jesus's ascension. So maybe you don't rem remember the story. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but let me just read a few of the verses. The time had come for the Lord to take Elijah, Elijah up, ascension, to heaven, again, ascension, in a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. So let's skip down then um, to verse 8. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water, which parted the, uh, right in the ground. They crossed over on the dry ground. New Exodus motif. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken from you. So Elisha answered, please let me inherit two shares of your spirit. Another translation says, please let me have a double portion of your spirit. <laughs> this is a big request. And Elijah is about to acknowledge that. Elijah says, wow, you've asked for something really difficult. You want two shares of my spirit. And notice what he says here. If you see me being taken from you, you will have it. If not, you won't. 
And that's a really interesting comment, isn't it? What is it about him witnessing Elijah ascending to the heavens that allows him to receive a double portion of the spirit? So let's keep reading. As they continue walking and talking, a chariot of fire with horses of fire suddenly appeared and separated them too. Then Elijah went up into heaven in the whirlwind. There's the ascension of Elijah. And as Elisha watched, he kept crying out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. When he could see him no longer, he took a hold of his clothes and tore them in two. He picked up his mantle that had fallen off Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took that mantle. He struck the water and the water parted and he crossed over. Now, look at what they say. When the sons of the prophets from Jericho who observed saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him and they bowed on the ground to him. So what happened? Well, Elisha watched Elijah ascend and he received a double portion of the spirit. Now, you should be thinking back to the New Testament. Where is it narrated that Jesus ascends? Remember, it's in Acts 1, 9 through 11. And what happens right before that? You will receive the Holy Spirit. I think the double portion in some sense of the Spirit, right? If you watch my ascension, and they watched his ascension, and then what happens in Acts 2? In Acts 2, that's exactly what happens. They receive the Spirit. When the day of Pentecost arrived, a violent rushing wind came down from heaven. It filled the whole house where they were staying. And so Jesus is not only acting as the prophet upon the earth, But now he's acting as the prophet in the heavens who is sending the spirit to help build his church. He fills us with his own spirit. So we actually reside in a better era now because Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the father. We have received a double portion of his spirit. It's better that he goes away. So let's let's look at this from another angle. Same point, but from another angle. John 16, verse 7. This is what Jesus says. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. I think, again, I said this at the beginning, (laughs) we like to think, no, it'd be better if Jesus just stayed and established the kingdom. But Jesus specifically says, no, it's for your benefit that I ascend. Why? Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. The spirit will not be sent to you, just like the Elijah and Elisha story. You won't get a double portion of my spirit. You won't receive the spirit if I don't go away. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he goes on to say, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So it's better. Why is it? So let's just dive into that a little more deeply. I know I'm running out of time here, but um, for question and answer, at least. It's better if Jesus leaves because... The incarnate Jesus was limited by space and time by virtue of his humanity. And it's better if the spirit comes because the spirit can indwell all of Christ's followers. Okay. There's a sense in which Jesus's prophetic work multiplies through his church and through his people, because we are now empowered with that same spirit that Jesus had. Second related Obtaining the spirit is better because Jesus' ascent doesn't mean his absence in an exclusive sense. It actually means Jesus is more present because the spirit is the spirit of Jesus, and we worship one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so it's not Jesus has left bodily, but he's still here by the power of the spirit. Okay, so he's absent and he's present, but he's present in a different way. So Our tendency is to think it would have been better for us to walk and talk with Jesus as the disciples did. John 16, 7 says, you live in a better era now. It's better that you have the spirit. That's, we read that verse and I think we can acknowledge it, but it's hard for us to to actually accept that because we want to walk and talk and be with Jesus. And we think it would have been better if we could see him and actually hear him. And Jesus says, no, it's just better if I go away for now. And then I will return. Okay, Um, there might be a lot of questions about that, but we can deal with those towards the end. I'm trying to think if I want to do this verse as well. Uh, No, I'm going to skip that. John 14, 18, Jesus' presence. He says, uh, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. Uh, John 7, 39, do I want to do that? Can't remember. Um, Yeah, just just to mention this, maybe. Um, He said this about the spirit. Those who believed him were going to receive the spirit. For the spirit had not yet been given. Because 
Jesus had not yet been glorified. It's not until Jesus is glorified. What's the logical, so I'll just give you a preview of this. What's the logical relationship between the spirit not being given before Jesus has been glorified? What's related to the divine missions? The mission, I'm going to use some big words here. The mission of the spirit extends the procession of the spirit and repeats in time the procession of the spirit from the father and son. In other words, the son and the spirit have a mission to the earth. But when we think about our God, our God it doesn't, doesn't exist just by what he does in creation. He exists in himself. And according to the confession of the early church, and I'd say the confession of the Bible itself, the, how we distinguish, although the Father, Son, and Spirit are one, how we distinguish the Father, Son, and Spirit is by their eternal relations of origin. And that the Son eternally is eternally begotten from the Father, and the Spirit spirates from the Father or the Father and the Son. And therefore, their missions upon the earth is going to extend that procession of the Son and the Spirit in time. So that it only makes sense that first the Son is given, and then the Spirit comes after the Son is given. That's a lot of systematic theology. If you're very confused, that's okay. I just want to say it's confirmed by these type of verses. Okay. So, conclusion about Jesus' prophetic work, and I'll try to get to priest and king briefly. Christ's prophetic work doesn't cease at the ascension. Rather, it continues and even increases and multiplies in a more expansive way, but in different ways after Jesus has been exalted. He works in and through us and by his spirit. Therefore, the ascension is very good news. And we can't neglect the ascension and say, Jesus just had to raise from the dead and he didn't need to ascend. No, the ascension was part of him becoming the greater prophet who would now build his church in a unique sense. First point. Second point about what Jesus is doing now is related to his priesthood. Jesus is not only, I would argue, Jesus was a type of priest upon the earth. That's debated. But Jesus was a type of priest upon the earth. But he's now a better priest because he's in heaven. And what is he doing in heaven? He's interceding before the Father in heaven. So um, maybe a brief shadow story from the Old Testament. I know this is getting a little long. If you can hold on for just a few minutes. Um, Exodus 24, uh, Matt, um, no, not Matthew, Moses ascends the mountain of God. Uh, and as he ascends the mountain of God, he meets with God and the cloud covers it. So there's some ascension language. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. So he goes up and he meets with God. He receives the law. Uh, we could say a lot more about this, but I'm trying to go quickly. But what also does Moses do when he ascends the mountain uh, for Israel? He actually intercedes. Um, remember, when Moses came down the mountain and he sees that they've made the golden calf. And so he, he breaks the tablets, but then he goes up on the mountain and um, he intercedes for the people. So I think it's actually later on in this story, uh, Exodus 32 verses 30. Um, now, uh, Moses said to the people, you have committed a grave sin. Now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord on the mountain and said, oh, these people have committed grave, grave sin. They have made for some themselves a God of gold. Now, if you would forgive their sin, if not, please erase me from the book that you have written. Now, that's an amazing moment of intercession from Moses. But what I think is evident there is there's, a, again, a shadow story like the Elijah and Elisha story. There's a shadow story of someone who's going to ascend and then intercede for his people. Remember, Moses is interceding for people for Israel, the covenant community. And now Jesus, according to Hebrews, ascends to the right hand of the Father, and he now intercedes for us. And I could say a lot about this, but let's just go to, I think, one text, or maybe two texts, Hebrews 7, 25. What is Jesus doing in heaven now? Well, he's building his church as the prophet, sending the Spirit. He's also interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. Uh, this is what the author of the Hebrews says. Therefore, he, Jesus, is able to save completely those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. So yes, he lives in his resurrection, but he actually intercedes for them at the right hand of the Father. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separate from sinners, exalted, you see that, above the heavens. He doesn't need to sacrifice every day as the high priests do on the earth. No, he's a better priest in the heaven. He's, he's serving in the better tent, right, in the heavens. And so what is he doing? I think this is a huge comfort for us as we think about Jesus's work and what he's doing now. 
Jesus is praying for you at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding for you. He is asking the, the Lord to protect you, Yahweh to protect you, to, to cause you to continue to walk in the faith. So Jesus is, is literally praying for you. So as you pray to him, it comes before the Father through the Son, and the Son presents those prayers to the father and the father will listen to the son. You can also think back. Um, I didn't, I'm not going to go to these texts, but you know, in Leviticus, it talks about the high priest going into the presence of the Lord. And it's, it's pictured as an upward journey because it's modeled after that Sinai uh, moment. And so the high priest goes before the Lord and what does he do? He has those jewels, the 12 jewels on his breastplate and the 12 jewels on his shoulders because he's representing the people of God and he's interceding for the people of God, before the Father, but in, in God's presence. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing now. Jesus is not inactive in the heavens. No, he is our intercessor in the heavens. He is our prophet in the heavens. He's our priest in the heavens. Another text we could go to, we could go to many other ones, but 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Um, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you might not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. With the Father, I think that's the word uh, parakletos that's used actually um, for the Spirit sometimes, but it, it, it could even be like a law term. You have an advocate, someone who advocates for you with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And where is he advocating with the Father for you? Well, at, at the right hand of the Father. That's exactly where he is. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, I was going to say more about that, but now I'm forgetting what I was going to say about that advocate. Oh yeah, Stephen, um, in Acts 7, remember when Stephen is being martyred, it, it's Jesus who stands up to advocate for that martyr at that point. So he is the one who's defending you, almost in a, in a law court type setting. So he's praying for you. He's defending you, not because the father is angry at you, but because he's the one who's representing you as the righteous one and saying, these are my brothers and sisters. These are my people. So you listen to their prayers because I am the one, I am the Messiah who has come and accomplished all that the Father has will. Okay. So that that is again a huge comfort. Um, you know, I just noted the words of Charles Wesley in the hymns, in the hymn that where he writes this. This is based on the ascension. Um, arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Where does he appear? Before the Father. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. Okay, before the throne, my, my sure, surety stands. My name is written on his hands. Five bleeding wounds he bears, received on Calvary. They pour effectual prayers. They strongly plead for me. Forgive him, oh, forgive, they cry. Nor let that ransom sinner die. Um, if you know the name... David Moffat, he's been doing a lot of work on Hebrews and intercession and atonement. And in my longer kind of presentation on this, I think it's important to recognize, like um, going back to Hebrews 7.25, that the atonement, in one sense, we, we have to be really careful and specific with how we speak about this, but the atonement in one sense is not complete at the cross. He is able to save, save completely those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. There's a sense in which atonement continues in his intercession. Now, I'm not being very nuanced about that. I recognize there might be questions about that. But I think we have to recognize my name is written on his hands. He brings as a, so, so I don't want to get too far in the details of this, but in the Old Testament, there was a two-stage process to a sacrifice. There was the slain, of the animal and the presentation of the animal before the throne, the, the throw, the, the, the scattering of the blood. I think Hebrews supports that Jesus is the high priest who was number one. He was the, the lamb who was slain, but he's also the one who goes with his blood before the father, which is what Charles Wesley is saying. I think the Christian tradition tends to support this, that he's the one who comes with the blood before the father and that is the presentation before the Father. So there's the, there, there's the killing and there's the presentation. And that's what I think Hebrews is, is alluding to there. He's able to save completely 
because he always lives to make intercession for them through his blood. And that, that's the paradox, right? He was dead, but now he's alive. And his, his blood stands for us even in the heavens. So I think you take that Old Testament picture of the priest going uh, into the presence of God. Jesus is like that new priest who goes into the presence of God with his blood, with his blood. It's a better blood, says the author of Hebrews. Okay, so conclusion to the priestly part, 1109. Try to go quickly. Christ's ascension is good news for his priestly office. The event can't be sidelined nor overlooked because it marks a shift in Christ's priestly work. He's now a priest interceding in heaven. Now his priestly work is universal, not limited to Israel. It's everlasting, never ceasing. It's unchangeable, never being superseded. It's effective, never only dealing outwardly with sin. It's pure. It's not stained by sin. It's heavenly. It's not relegated to the earth. So it's a better intercession. Okay, finally, and I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, yeah, this is my last little point here. What, the ascension of the king. So we've seen how he's a better prophet. He's a better priest. And I'm going to argue he's a better king. Why is he a better king? Because now he's Lord over all. I've, 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 I've um, alluded to this in the past, right? He, he, Jesus came as Lord and, uh, Lord and Messiah, but there's a sense in which the ascension, and this is actually the key point. What, what does the ascension do? It installs Jesus as the king over all. Okay, that's why in Acts 2.36, if we go back there, um, that it's at the ascension, resurrection and ascension, I'd argue, that he's installed. Um, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Okay, so the, the best, the most simple way I can explain this is actually given an illustration from Lion King. In the movie Lion King, um, if you remember that movie, Simba comes back because his uncle Scar has taken over the land, right? And he defeats Scar uh, in that battle uh, on Pride Rock. Um, but but if you remember, that, that's kind of like the cross. Simba doesn't die, but that's kind of like the cross where you think that's the climax. Scar is defeated. Like he's dead. The hyenas gobble him up, right? But there's a scene, both in the newer Lion King and the older Lion King, that um, the, the baboon Rafiki, right? He takes his staff and he point, points to Pride Rock and he says, he basically says, you need to ascend and become king. You need to ascend Pride Rock and become king. And so the, the whole movie like slows down and this dramatic music comes on. But the point is Simba's kingship is not, um, it, it's not complete until he ascends the throne. And, and that's, that's the cultural script that you need to have in the back of your mind when Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father. This is the installation of the king. This is not, not just to an earthly throne, no, but to a heavenly throne, which means he's Lord over all. We've seen that in Matthew 28. And this is where, when you go back to the Old Testament, we've looked at a few what I call shadow stories with Elijah and Elisha and Moses and the priests. But this is where Daniel 7, 13, 14 come in, right? Uh, coming with the clouds of heaven, there was one like a son of man, ascension. He approached the ancient of days, Yahweh himself, was escorted before him, and he was made king. That's exactly what 7, 14 is saying. So what happened in the ascension is Jesus is installed as the king. If you don't have the ascension, you don't have the installation of the king. That's what you, lo that's what you lose. And I, our gospel is based on Jesus as Lord. So if you don't have the ascension, I don't know what you have, but you don't have Christianity. Um, Psalm 110. This is, uh, I love these verses, these next two, because they give a picture of what was said to the son when he ascended. So remember in, at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts, you get a little narrative of what happens, but you only see it from an earthly point of view. You don't see it from a heavenly point of view. So what actually happened when Jesus ascended? You actually, in a weird way, have to go backwards in your Bible. To, to hear. Uh, this is the declaration of the Lord. This is what the Lord said to my Lord. This is David speaking. J Jesus uses this a lot, right? And his, in his, he uses it to stump people. So this is what the Lord Yahweh said to Jesus. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Reign, <laughs> rule until the end. It's, the ascension is a climax. It's not the climax because we're waiting for this, right? The new heavens, the new earth. But what did the father say to him? Sit. 
You've completed what I told you to. Now continue, but uh, just to be clear, sit, you've completed, but you continue to work. Sitting uh, on a cabinet is one of the most hard things to do in terms of doing the job, right? So sitting doesn't imply inaction or lack of action, but rather it's he, he rules and reigns from that seated position. Uh, where else do we see what the father says to the son as he ascends to the right hand? Uh, Psalm 2-7. Psalm 2-7. I will tell of the Lord's decree to me. Now the son is speaking. He said to me, the father said to the son, you are my son. Today I've become your father. I, I This is another way of saying I've installed you as the king. Now we read Psalm 2-7. We're like, oh, that's the installation of the Davidic king. But who is the true Davidic king? It's Jesus. And so these, this is the verse that's actually quoted by Paul and by Peter in their sermons to say, look, Jesus Christ has become the king. Now, they, uh, it gets complicated because they quote it in terms of his resurrection. But I think, again, resurrection and ascension are paired. Um, 11, 14. Let me go to one other, one other text, cool text to show you just one thing, and then hopefully I'll open up the questions. Um, the, the other thing to mention in terms of the Old Testament is just note that this is, remember, it's the son of man who ascends while the beasts in Daniel 7 are the ones who want to ascend to that ruling and reigning position. But it's also Satan himself, the devil himself who wanted to ascend. And it's the son who gets to ascend. So in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14, there's a lot of debate about who it's referring to. I'm just going to submit that it's about Yes, it's about Babylon, but yes, it's about the, the one who animates Babylon as well. Shining morning star, how you have fallen from the heavens, you destroyer of the nations. You have been cut down to the ground. Most people think this refers to the fall of Satan. You said to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high, but you will be brought down to Sheol to the deepest regions of the pit. Wow. I mean, that the, I, I hadn't even noticed that until I started studying the ascension, that it was Satan himself who wanted to ascend, to set up his own throne, that, that wanted to ascend. But who gets to ascend? It's the son of man, the one who humbles himself, the one who isn't proud. That's why he's called the human one. So it's at the ascension, as I've been mentioning, that Jesus is made um, the king. He's installed as the king. So uh, Hebrews 1, 3 through 4, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, the exact uh, expression of his nature, sustain all things by his powerful world, word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, that's the session. So he became superior to the angels, just as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. What's the name he has inherited? Son. You are my son. Today I've become your father, right? Where he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's the installation, right? And we already looked at Ephesians 1, 20 through 22. Uh, he exercised his power in Christ by raising from the dead and seating him at the right hand of the heavens. Far above what? All rule and authority, power and dominion. Not only in this age, but in the age to come. Not only just spiritual forces, but every, every force on heaven and on earth. And he subjected everything under his feet, and he made him head for, out of over everything for his church, which is his body. And now his body will fill all things in every way, because Jesus will fill all things in every way. So Jesus's lordship, I think this is, I mean, in one sense, this is the most important point. Jesus's lordship is confirmed at the ascension. It, he's installed, but his lordship also endures. He, he continues to be lord. When he sat down, it wasn't a, for a brief cessation from warfare, but an age-long conflict with the powers of evil. Sit until I make all your enemies your footstool. At Christ's ascent, he appeared before the ancient days and was given all dominion. He was set on a holy hill and declared to be God's son. If the ascension did not happen, Jesus' royal authority is not confirmed. If the ascension did not happen, then Christ is not ruling in heaven. If the ascension did not happen then the church is not an entity. If the ascension did not happen, then no human will ever rule with God. If the ascension did not happen, Christ is not installed as Lord. Because the ascension happened, Jesus's royal authority is confirmed. Okay, 
Uh, I hope you got a good sense of why the Ascension is important. We're at 1118, so I didn't give much time for uh, comments or questions, but I think that's good for now. We'll just open it up for a brief time of Q&A. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. We have covered a lot of ground uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, covered a lot of ground, uh, it, it, some of it briefly. So certainly if there are uh, elements of what Dr. Schreiner has already talked about that you want to circle back around to and, and perhaps get some, some more in depth on that or more clarity, uh, certainly make note of that. Again, use the, uh, the Q&A button uh, that you have at the bottom of your screen uh, and any questions that, that you would like to direct uh, to Dr. Schreiner, please use that and we'll, uh, we'll try to get through as many of those as we can uh, here in the next couple of minutes. Uh, you know, it was interesting when you first started talking uh, and you mentioned that when we preach or when we give a gospel presentation, we don't include the ascension. And I thought, wow, guilty as charged. Uh, and then I, where my brain went was 1 Corinthians 15 and thought, mm -hmm. well, but, but Paul doesn't either, which, of course, you, you brought up. Yeah. Uh, do you see you mentioned kind of ascension being subsumed into to resurrection there? Do you think Ascension is there or kind of like you've been doing in this whole presentation? Do we just need to read 1 Corinthians 15 in light of what else Paul is writing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, yes, we need to read. I think we need to read all texts of the scripture in light of the whole canon. So number one, that would just help support. But I think there's something. So if you take a wide view, I would just say it's 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 part and parcel of what the gospel is. Uh, and. More specifically, though, in this text, I would just pause on this word. He, he became, like, according to Acts 2.36, he became Lord and Messiah at his resurrection and ascension. So I think if you double click on that word, I could literally double click on the word, I guess, but I use that language. Um, if you double click on the word Christ, Messiah, he's Messiah because he is ascended before the Father. So I think it's actually in that word that the ascension is implied. He is Lord and Messiah because he has been raised from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father. Now, so I, I actually think it's it's part of um, it's it's part of the package there, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 2 through uh, 5. Um, the other thing I'd say though is I don't uh, I don't mean that there's a tendency. I, I think it does make people think, and I, I'm gl I'm always glad that I say that we need to include in our gospel presentations. There's a tendency to take whoever's pet project and say this needs to be part of the gospel, and then suddenly, normal everyday Christians are like, I can't remember all these fifty things, and like, what do you like? You're just adding another thing, and so I I want to be careful to say what I'm not trying to do is make things more complex. What I am saying is you need to make sure that you don't stop at Jesus's death and you get to his victory and his installation. So whatever that looks like, you don't even have to say the word ascension. I'm just saying, make sure that you, you say Jesus died for your sins <laughs> and he's not he's, still in the tomb. <laughs> yeah. He's reigning and ruling now he's Lord. So when we ask people to submit themselves to the good news, the good news is that Jesus is King and he becomes King by what he's done in his life, death, birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension. So as long as, I think my big point is, as long as you have that thought orbiting there, <laughs> and it's it's communicated in some way that Jesus is now calling you to submit yourself in every way to his life and his rule and reign. Well, then, then I think it's implied in there. So uh, I, I do want to back away from that statement just and not say I'm just adding one more thing for you to say or else you don't have a complete gospel presentation. Sure. I am saying, I think if I state it that way and I overemphasize it, it, it will make you <laughs> be right. more cognizant of that kind of exaltation theme. Absolutely. No, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, one of the pieces that we went through very quickly was uh, kind of both the Jewish and, and Greco-Roman background to the idea of ascension. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned son of man a couple of times. C can you talk about that? H how does son of man link to ascension? Is that from Daniel 7 or elsewhere? Yeah. So I think it is mainly from Daniel 7. Uh, Ezekiel uses son of man as a prophetic term as well. Um, but I think Jesus is pulling on the tradition pretty clearly of Daniel 7. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's basically the typical answer that most scholars give, but I think Jesus uses the term son of man to refer to himself because uh, it's just a, another term for a human one. And he doesn't want them to overload what messianic hopes they have in him before he clarifies his messianic task. So he uses a, a more obscure term so that they're not, so they're wondering a little bit, son of man, human one. When they really get mad is when they start thinking, you're saying you're the Messiah. You're saying you're the son of God. And he says, you will see the son of man. So I think if you um, understand there's a deeper meaning to the son of man, th then Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm the one who's going to rule and reign over all that son of man from Daniel 7. How it connects to the ascension is in Daniel 7, and I just alluded to this, um, it, it's it's the kingdoms of the earth and the rulers of the kingdoms of the earth, what, what Daniel describes as beasts. Uh, and really malformed beasts, non-kosher beasts that want to ascend and rule and reign and have all dominion and authority. And it's contrasted with this humble human figure who's pure and is not seeking that in the same way. And that's where I think you tie the Son of Man language to the Gospels, where Jesus submits himself to the Father's will as the truly human one. And it's not these kind of non-kosher, malformed, ex exotic, crazy beasts that will ascend, but rather it's the humble king who ends up ascending. So it's, there, there's a paradox and a, a nice pairing there, which the rest of the New Testament will obviously pick up on Philippians 2. It's the one who humbled himself that is now exalted. Right. It's the one who came in the form of man that will now be shown to be in the form of God. Um, so I think uh, there's a lot more you could say, but, uh, it's showing us it's, it's the one that doesn't look like it's the suffering servant who we would think, man, you have, there's nothing glorious about you. It, that's the one who's actually glorified. It's the one who's crucified. It's the one who's some, yeah. So I could, I could keep, keep going on that, but I don't know if that's exactly what your question was, but that's how I kind of tease out some of the son of man stuff. Sure. Sure. No, I think that's helpful. Um, you, you also mentioned, and, and I think it's helpful to think along these lines, sort of the, uh, the odd aspects uh, of the ascension, the, those things that are just mm. hard to picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that extends to the title of your lecture, What is Jesus Doing Now? Um, and, and sort of how does that work? There, there's a uh, a physical body in the spiritual realm, usually when we think of, of heaven, we think of, you know, floating angels on clouds. Um, I don't know that we can say much about that biblically as, as far as a, a physical presence in a spiritual realm, um, but, but then also from a Trinitarian perspective, how, yeah. how is Jesus with the Father and separate from the Father? So, that, yeah. That's a big round, but if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we don't have, the scriptures don't give us a lot of precise details or answers on some of those questions. So um, I'm taking um, kind of logical deductions from what we see in the scriptures and what they do tell us to try to conceive of what's what's going on. I, I think, um, you know, many people ask me, they're like, so where is Jesus now? Well, he's in the heavens. And where is that? Well, it's it's both a place because Jesus has a body. And it's I think it's beyond our conception of place. It's not like if we just keep going up and up and up, I think we'll find it. So in one sense, it's um, beyond what we conceive of as a space. But it's also, I think he's really ruling on a throne uh, in a physical sense because he still has a body. But according to 1 Corinthians 15, that body is now glorified. And that glorified body, we don't know a lot about, but it's a body from heaven that is turned in a different way <laughs> to a different type of body. And that's the type of bodies I think we will receive in the new heavens, new earth. We don't get a lot of details on that, but it, it says it's a spiritual body, which doesn't mean non-physical. I think it means it's a different type of body. And so I think in that sense, maybe a logical way, somewhat logical way to think, maybe people <laughs> don't think this is logical, but... A uh, somewhat logical way to think of it is it's like he has a body, but it's a different type of body than we could conceive of. And therefore, it makes sense that it's in a, both a physical place and a different type of physical place mm -hmm. and that we can't quite understand yet. Um, and so I, I, the two things that I'm trying to affirm is, number one, the physical nature of Jesus's continued body and the fact that his body has changed in some way. He has been exalted. 
He has received that glorified body. That's why it speaks about he, he's received the first fruits. And I, I do think I'm actually doing more work on this right now. I do think it's even maybe different. I tend to think it's different than his resurrection body. Now, that sounds crazy, but I don't think, I think the transfiguration, which is my current project, shows us that his resurrection body was even different. They, they, they weren't blinded by Jesus every time they saw him. <laughs> but when they see him in the transfiguration, they almost can't look at him. And that's tied to cloud and brightness, which is tied to his return and we're tied to his ascension. So some people in the church tradition, Origen himself, said that, you know, Jesus had a physical body before. Um, you know, yeah, I need to do more work on this. I mean, be careful with how I say this. Jesus had a physical body before his death and resurrection. He had a different type of body at his resur- at his his after his resurrection. But there is a sense in which he was even more glorified at his ascension. And you see that in his return. And then he blows the trumpet and we all get those glorified bodies. So my tendency has been to equate the glorified body of Jesus with the resurrected body. And I, I will just submit to you, I'm, I'm still on a journey here. I'm, I, I don't know if that's my complete conclusion, but I wonder if there's a slight distinction between his resurrected body and his complete glorified body, because why would that be the case? Um, I don't think human beings could live in the presence of his glory, according to all the visions that we see in Revelation, if he showed him his full glory post-resurrection. They're, they're, so I just keep going back to that they're not being blinded by his presence. But yeah. everything everything post-ascension, they're blinded by uh, Saul, Paul on the Damascus Road, Stephen, completely blinded by his presence. And then you have, um, you have all the Old Testament theophanies. Uh, and then you have in the New Testament, you have Revelation, where he falls down before this bright, shining one that he can't be in the presence of. So... Um, I would love to talk to more people about, I, this is the first time I've said that all that live. So, um, <laughs> I'd love to talk to more. This is people. exciting. We're getting online <laughs> research. I'd love to talk to more people about how they conceive of that because, and th- this is where I, you know, when I was doing work on the transfiguration, I was just linking it to the resurrection. And I thought, you know, it's actually more linked to the ascension and the parousia, the second coming, the tra- transfiguration scene. So that would, that's what kind of got me going on saying maybe maybe there's a distinction here that I haven't recognized before. And it was helpful, although Origin says some weird things. Um, it was helpful to see Origin saying the same thing. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not completely crazy here. Um, but maybe systematic theologians will correct me on this in the future and I will recant. Uh, sure, but I'm sure. I'm kind of leaning this way right now. So yeah, yeah. Is there anything in in John 20 when when Jesus says to Mary, don't hold on to me because I haven't ascended. Is, is that tie into this at all? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, yeah, it does. I've, I use that text a lot to show people in these lectures that the resurrection is not the end of the story. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, Hey, don't hold on to me. The story's not over. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think tied into that, don't hold on to me because it's not complete in terms of maybe even me receiving that glorified body in the fullest sense. Yeah. So sometimes I've thought maybe he, re- he has the glorified body in the resurrection, but it's um, he's not revealing it. You know what I mean? Like maybe you could say that like there's a, there's a hiddenness to it. Um, uh, yeah. I, his resurrected body is, uh, uh, can I say this and s- still be okay? It's so <laughs> weird because like on the Emmaus road, like the disciples don't even recognize him. Right, right. He, he's visible. And so it's like, what, what is going on not. here? <laughs> and then he eats the bread and they recognize him. And I'm like, I, and then he, you know, he, he eats fish. He walks through doors. He appears. And so it's like, what's going on here? But yeah, I, I'm, I'm still working through all that. Yeah. Well, yeah. oh, it's fun to think funny. about. We'll, we'll look forward to your next book. Great. Yeah. I'll figure it all out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, as we wrap up today, uh, please let us know uh, how can we follow your work? Are there ways that we can track with what you're doing? And uh, you've given us sort of a little glimpse, but but what projects are coming down the pike for you? Yeah, so you could just go to my Amazon kind of page, author page, and that's where I have my books. I'm, I'm a bad marketer myself. I don't have my own website, um, but you could go to my Amazon page and just kind of see what I'm working on there. 
Uh, I, I'm pretty active on Twitter and I kind of announce what I'm doing there. So as I mentioned right now, my current work is on the transfiguration. I would argue another neglected aspect of Christ's life. So I'm kind of trying to do a few projects on things that maybe we don't think about as much in the Eastern tradition. It's a very big deal, a Western tradition, not as much so. Uh, and then I have a book on the theology of Matthew coming. And then after that, I'm, I'm hoping to do a book on the fourfold method in terms of hermeneutics so that you have the literal sense and the spiritual sense of scripture and kind of uh, walk down that path to find some help in terms of how we interpret. So yeah, those are, uh, oh, oh yeah. And I forgot, I have a book on politics coming out in October. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of a, a book on political discipleship, less scholarly, a little bit more lay level uh, for people in the church to think about political discipleship. Awesome. Not well, controversial at all. Right, right. Yeah, everyone yeah. would agree. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This has been great. Uh, and for all those who have uh, tuned in, we appreciate. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, put October 24th on your calendar. We will be uh, meeting together for our in-person uh, theological study day with Dr. Lynn Kohek. Uh, again, Dr. Schreiner, thank you so much for today. Uh, and God's richest blessings on you. Thanks for having me. Fun to be with you all.